Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Ian Lesser. Good afternoon, I'm Ian Lesser from GMF in Brussels. And before we start our last plenary session, I just wanted to uh, come out and say a few words about some other aspects of the work we're doing on the wider Atlantic. The animating idea behind this, all of this work really, is to get people to think in more imaginative ways about the Atlantic, about our mental maps about the Atlantic, to think not just about the transatlantic relationship between the United States and Europe, uh, but in that north-south axis, but also to think about what's going on in the south, to think about the role of Latin America and Africa and the Caribbean in this Atlantic equation. In addition to the Atlantic dialogues, we also have a very active research program. And in our partnership with uh, OCP Foundation and with the OCP Policy Center, we've been doing a lot of very interesting work, and I hope you'll have a look at it. It's most of it online, and you can get it through uh, AD Connect. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work looking at long-term trends, things that we think will be important to the future of the region in a, in a big way, either the geoeconomics or the geopolitics. Just to give you a few examples, we've been looking at the very dramatic increase in energy production in the Atlantic Basin and what this will mean for the geoeconomics of the region in the future. We've been looking at the role of new actors, Asia, India, others from outside the Atlantic space and their stakes, their interests and what they will be doing in the Atlantic over the next years. We've also been looking at the future of the maritime space itself, the Atlantic, and what's happening in terms of ports and infrastructure and maritime security. What will it mean to have an expansion of the Panama Canal in the next year or two? Things like that. So these are big picture trends that we've spent a lot of time looking at. But I think you'll agree that in addition to these big trends, there's also a question of shocks, the unexpected. Uh, things that can happen, positive, negative, or simply transforming, that would change the future of the Atlantic space for societies and for interactions around the Atlantic. And that's really the context for our next session, to look at those shocks and unexpected events. So before we start, there'll be a short film. During the past decade, the world has seen a flurry of technological change and innovation that has transformed the way in which we conduct our daily lives and how we interact with one another. Some argue, though, that greater interconnectedness and access to information has increased our vulnerabilities to the consequences of man-made and natural disruptions. Global health pandemics, political revolutions, cyber attacks, economic meltdowns, government shutdowns, and increasingly destructive natural disasters are just a few examples of disruptions that have occurred during the past 10 years and may just be the tip of the iceberg of what the future holds. How has the Atlantic community managed the disruptions and downturns of the past decade, particularly the global financial crisis? Have our institutions and governments helped or hurt the recovery and are they adequately equipped to handle the next crisis? How can we as a community prepare for the future? And to moderate this last session, last plenary session on managing disruptions in the Atlantic space, we're really delighted to have Jonathan Capehart from the editorial board of the Washington Post with us. Jonathan, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much, Ian, thank you. Uh, and thank you all for being here. I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer of the Washington Post, and an MSNBC contributor, and I, for over the next hour or so, I will be your, I should say, our guide in the conversation um, that we're about to have on moderating, dis I'm sorry, managing disruptions in the Atlantic sphere. As we saw in the film, there are any number of disruptions. There are disruptions within borders, such as war in Mali, Congo, or a government shutdown in Washington, D.C. There are disruptions across borders, say mass migration from North Africa to the shores of Italy. And then there are disruptions that span borders. By that I mean terrorism or uh, also, uh, the, say, the economic collapse of 2008. So those are just some of the disruptions that um, have occurred. But I want you to take out your Spot Me app 
and go to the tag cloud, which is just under Q&A, and type in what you think um, disrupt a disruption that nations have to deal with. You've heard me give some. There's war, terrorism, migration. But surely there's some that are not as obvious as those. So type those in, and I think you have about you have 40, yeah, 45 seconds. And while you can do that now, I'll introduce the panel. First is Juan Pardinas. He is the Director General of the Instituto Mexicano para la Competitividad and a weekly newspaper columnist for Reforma. Next to him is Jane Lute. She is President and CEO of the Council on Cybersecurity, and she was most recently the Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. And last but not least, Alfredo Valadao. He's a professor of, at the Paris School of International Affairs of Sciences Po. I was going to do um, your institute in French, as I did uh, Juan's no in Spanish, but my French is terrible. So I'm sorry about that. So welcome. Let's welcome them all here. So as we see in the word cloud, economic security is a um, major disruption uh, people put in, uh, disaster, chain, disaster change, I don't know if that, oh, climate change is what that's related to, and then there's disaster disease. I want to ask a question of all of you, and be as brief as you can. What is, to your mind, or what has been the most disruptive event of the last five to ten years and why? Let's start with you, Juan. Uh, I had a conversation a couple of months ago with uh, Richard Newell. Uh, Richard used to be the head of the Energy Information Administration in the U.S. from 2009 to 2011. And one day he was at his desk. He, he basically, his job is concentrating all the information from the US and the rest of the world on, on energy issues. And uh, the first time he got the spike of production of oil uh, from uh, inside the US, this was around 2010. And they were about to send to press uh, all the data that every year they produced in the, in the most relevant annual report on maybe of, on global energy. And when he saw the data, he got very angry with, the, with his staff, but said, this, this cannot be right. This is wrong. You go back and check the numbers. The U.S. production of energy cannot spike so fast. It hasn't happened in, in decades. Why, uh, why the numbers say it's happening now. Well, the staff came back, said, sorry, sir, the numbers are right. This happened two years ago. If you uh, read uh, some books or reports about energy or oil, you would be hearing about the end of oil, even in uh, books written in 2008, what would the, the US would do with the scarcity of, of, of energy. And then in a three, four year period, we are starting to wonder about the opposite. Just uh, this month, China surpassed the US as the first importer of hydrocarbon products in the world. And the US surpassed Saudi Arabia as the first producer of hydrocarbons in the world. If you check the uh, Energy uh, Information Administration report at the beginning of 2012, so we are talking about 18 months, they were expecting that the US will surpass Saudi Arabia, but they were expecting it around 2017. So in the last of 16, 18 months, the energy production in the US has reshaped what I would say a new global energy order. That, and that's a disruption from the perspective of a positive disruption from the perspective of, of the US economy. But what would happen to a country like my country, like Mexico, what 80% of our exports go to the US, we, uh, our main market for our energy products is the US. What would happen to political stability in a place like Saudi Arabia? without the resources coming uh, from, uh, from oil and energy. 
this new energy global order will affect lives of so many people in so many ways that uh, only imagination could really help us to, to foresee the consequences of this new global order. So I think uh, the nations have had to deal with two major disruptions over the last 20 years. Uh, in the 1990s, I think nations finally had to confront the reality that while in 1648 the modern state system was founded so that sovereigns could protect their populations from marauding outsiders, in the 1990s the international community realized that outsiders had to protect populations from marauding sovereigns. Uh, and this turned the international community in many respects on its head. Uh, in the past five or ten years, uh, to me the most significant disruption, uh, bar none, is really the intersection of two trends, a trend of growth and a trend of decay. Uh, and I call this disruption Adam rising, Adam and Eve rising. The trend of growth is an unmistakable cyber awakening uh, that's accompanying the penetration of the internet. And globally, the internet has penetrated the world's population to about 30%. Some project we will all be connected and online in less than 10 years. And in conjunction with that connection, we are all now instantaneously aware and connected not only to information, but to others who share our cause. That's the trend of growth. The trend of decay, which is contributing to the disruption that nations are facing, is the near total collapse of public trust in public institutions. And it's true globally. Um, so what we are seeing fundamentally is the rise of the human being taking matters into their own hands, and one might only say it's about time. Alfredo. Well, uh, I would like to start with a quote from one of the greatest philosophers of the 21st century, which is former U.S. Secretary uh, Donald Rumsfeld, who in a seminal speech uh, made the difference between known unknowns and unknowns unknowns. Uh, and I think today we have to look at unknown and unknowns and I think the most disruptive thing that happened in the last years was the silent conver convergence uh, of all the new information technologies like big data, cloud computing, uh, uh, internet of things that are coming up, uh, 3D printing, uh, modern fracking, uh, all this that people start to call uh, uh, Internet of Everything. Uh, and we are passing from an economy that since Henry Ford was based in mass production for mass consumption to a new economy, a new digital economy that is made by distributed production to customize mass consumption. And this means that the way we consume our, our, our products, the way we produce them, is going into an enormous revolution. The, the, the life of a product will be shorter and shorter. Uh, supply chains will be shorter and shorter. And this will have extreme consequences on the whole chain of value and the ge geoeconomic distribution of wealth. And what is terrible in all this is to know who's going to get, who's going to gobble the big chunk of value added. And the ones who are going to gobble is the clusters that have very good education, very good connectedness, uh, very freedom to create, to think, and where there is possibility of uh, disruptions, even invested interests about this. And so the problem is that this is not going to be distributed by countries, but inside countries. You you're going to have clusters that will get this value added, Beside, with a huge gap with clusters that are going down. So uh, welcome to Tea Party world, uh, everywhere. And so I'm not sure that governments, I'm even sure now we, we see that governments has less and less power to guarantee a more or less acceptable distribution of wealth inside its borders. So, so we're going to have a, a, a real problem of governance and of social cohesion in the, in the next 10. Well, that leads to the question I was, going, I was going to ask. How does a government then, given what you've said, um, Professor, what you've said, Jane, what you've said, Juan, how do governments manage these types of disruptions that, that you're talking about? How does a government 
um, manage the distribution of these resources if they're going to um, well-heeled clusters, as you're talking about? They, they have less and less power to do it. So what is, what is the solution? In general, maybe a good cooperation between government. We've seen with that crisis, uh, even for the, the financial system, they have to put together this G20, etc., etc. But this is too little. If we want to solve these questions, which is a kind of how you distribute wealth, not only inside borders, but outside borders, and clusters that are transnationally connected, you need some form of supranational authority. Which nobody knows what the hell is this. And, uh, and, and, the, and the problem is that these, these governments, if they want to, to make very cooperation and have a real power on that, they'll have to give more and more chunks of sovereignty. But nobody wants to do that. So how are we going to do it? We don't know. How, uh, uh, so how do you, I think a super transnational authority. Well, no, what, what, what would that look like? Who would that? Who? Well, well I, I think it's a debatable proposition. Um, I, I think few of us in this room would agree that, that, you know, would disagree with the fact that governments are struggling right now. Um, it's, no one interacts with their government unless they have to. Um, unless they have to. And governments have never been particularly good at reaching either the very wealthy or the very poor. So when we ask ourselves, what is the value proposition of government and why would we need more of it at any level? I mean, at some, at some level, long before there were countries, there were cities. And in very interesting cases around the world, there are cities who are getting it quite right. And they're delivering a value proposition of security, well-being, and justice for their population. So we can get back to basics. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I think I, this, this idea of a global government, it sounds a bit like the mother of all bureaucracies, but, <laughs> uh, uh, but I, I share the anguish that how are you going to deal with these technological changes that, and, and governments are usually three or uh, not, not three steps behind, it's three generations behind. Uh, 3D printing, for example, we could foresee a world that the cost of produ producing a car would be more or less the same if it happens in Detroit, if it happens in Stuttgart, if it happens in, in Mexico. What would that mean for uh, the concept of uh, industrial outsourcing? What would that mean for the vision that we have? Uh, and going back to the concept of what's a disruption, it's basically a change of trajectory. It's, we, we have to uh, find a big draw in, in our mental desks and put all the cliches that explain the world uh, uh, of the past and try to find new ones to explain what's going on. We, we foresaw or we were comfortable in a world where China was the hub of industrial manufacturing. But with 3D printing, any part of the world could become the, a new hub of industrial manufacturing. What would governments could do about it? Well, I, for that I don't have a, a, a good answer. Now you, when we talked earlier, you, both you and Alfredo talked, uh, mentioning 3D printing. And you ta mentioned to me a conversation, I don't know if we can say who you had the conversation with in terms of manufacturing, say, oh, I don't know, refrigerators. Um, and there was a statistic that, that this person told you that, I, that blew my mind. And I wonder if you could share, share that in terms of what it would mean for the production of, say, this refrigerator. Yeah, it's, it was a conversation a couple of months with one of the top CEOs of General Electric. Said they are aiming with advanced manufacturing systems to build the fridge with three hours of labor. So if you could imagine a fridge built with three hours of labor, maybe you could imagine a car built with 25 hours of labor. Where that labor will come from, how, wh which in added investments you need to produce those cars, which would be the part, uh, what would labor would be in the future if you put human beings and robotics uh, competing for, for efficiency. That's what we are, we are talking about when, when we uh, mention advanced manufacturing. I think one of the things we have to remember about technology, um, no matter how advanced, how exotic, uh, how extraordinary, is that it ultimately ends up in individuals' hands. 
I mean, we're all carrying around multiple devices that at one time were the province of only the biggest governments and only perhaps of the most exclusive parts of those big governments. Or they were, imagine, they were imaginations in the minds of scientists. And we now carry them around and take them for granted. They become utilities in our lives. That's an inevitable aspect of technology. Um, is that disruptive? Uh, that's normal now for us. I mean, my generation is the last generation that will get any joy out of the internet because we're the last ones who remember what life was like before it existed. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, so I, I think you know, this whole conversation about disruption, is migration disruption? Shame on us. People have been moving since Australopithecus, for goodness sake. Um, is war disruptive? War is tragic. Uh, war is an awful thing. War is not the weather. Um, and we shouldn't act like it is. So I think there are really some, some tectonic movements mo happening now among people around the world. Again, as we become to appreciate the power, the value, and the wealth in data liquidity to which we now all have access. Grab my microphone situation. Um, in the description for the for this panel, it had a line in there about how greater greater global connectivity has led to greater blindness um, to our vulnerabilities, and that struck me as odd. How is it that? In this time of greater global connectivity, when we apparently seem to know everything that's happening in every part of the world at every second of the day, how does that lead to blindness to vulnerabilities? So, so I'm a parent. We were always <laughs> aware of everything. Um, I, I, I find it, I, I find that incomprehensible. Um, sure, there are, are vulnerabilities that more of us have. But there's powerful, there are powerful norms that have emerged and I think have only been accelerated by our access to technology and information. Norms of inclusivity. Nothing about me without me. Norms of transparency. What's going on here? Norms of reciprocity. If you're going to make me do it, you better do it as well. And norms of accountability. Those are powerful norms now that every government has to deal with. You know, I want to, this isn't just a conversation amongst the three of them and me, but it's a conversation with you. So I'd like to open it up to questions. Either there's a person here with her hand raised or also um, you can put a question in to the Spot Me app and we, it'll pop up on the screen the moment we have many of them. But if we have a microphone that is available, you can go right here to the young lady here in the front row. Here. And please don't forget to identify yourself, who you are, where you're from. It's Sarah on. Hariharan from the United States. Uh, very apropos to the question we were just uh, addressing on connectivity. And I ask, and maybe this is an antithesis to the whole point of this forum, which is that connectivity is good. I come from the financial sector, and I do feel that the very high level of connectivity at a financial level, at a trade level, has actually been a disadvantage in recent times. I think, for example, if we, we go back to previous economic crises from 10, 12 years ago, Asia or the tequila crisis in Mexico, while, while they were very difficult to contend with, their spillovers were easily contained. Whereas now, between the Lehman and the Euro crisis, we have much more spillover risks into a much broader section of economies. And if any of you watch the markets, you've been seeing every time Mr. Bernanke at the Federal Reserve opens his mouth, we have asset prices all over the world reacting almost immediately. So perhaps this is, this is bringing up also a lot of negative consequences in the sense that some countries are imposing macro prudential controls, some of them are trying some forms of protectionism, so it seems like a it's a, it seems like a very mixed sort of uh, bias. Thank you. Yeah. Reaction to that, Alfredo? Yes, uh, every technology, every new technology, you, you have good good things and bad things. Uh, what I think the, the the consequences of connectivity is that the more you are connected, the more uh, rapidly you have innovation. Uh, you have a lot of innovations coming on. And it's like a permanent Schumpeterian creative destruction. Uh, so the problem is how societies will adapt to that. 
And I'm, I also talk about how power <coughs> groups will adapt to that, because the more you have these innovative things, the more it challenges the power of uh, groups that exist. So how in, in a polity that is more or less thriving on certain uh, known things, how can we adapt completely to that? And I want to, to, to agree with, uh, with Jane here on the fact that local government is becoming more and more important. So you have local government important, importance and you have cooper transnational cooperation of governments, but the, the central national government is having problems with that. Huh? And, and so how, how do we, how we, we can deal with that uh, gap uh, uh, between national government and local governments? I, I guess I'm gonna disagree. I mean, it's always true that a little information in the hands of the eager is a dangerous thing. Um, but I don't think when, in response to that, we, we, we keep the population in the dark. Um, what's at our disadvantage is not understanding the responsibilities of our decision making, given this connectivity and this reach. Um, you know, frankly, we, we live in an age when we know before victims do that they'll be victims. What, is, what responsibilities does that give us? I mean, we live in an age where people are connected instantaneously to information and to each other around the world. Really, what does it mean to be a minority today uh, in that kind of world? So, I'm, I'm more of placing a burden on the responsibilities of decision making than on the technology that has so enriched all of our lives. We have a question right here. Microphone, microphone's coming. Right here, on your right, uh, left. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we've, we've been talking about governance and different forms of governance uh, throughout this incredible conference. And you've talked about the complexities of governance in the, the changing times that we are going through and the disrupt disruptions that these new complex governance mechanisms that of course will not be either local or international, either world or national, they will be much more complex than what we have today and we're moving in that direction. Given this, I have two questions. One is, how are we going to deal with violence? How, in what measure will the crisis of the whole idea of the monopoly of violence by the state will be uh, and is already a disruption? And second, how are we going to be able to, in this world of complex governance, maintain the principles that are, I'm sure, so dear to all of us of democracy? Thank you. Great. Thank you. I, I feel strongly on this question about violence. Um, war is not the weather. We shouldn't act like it is. We can prevent mass violence on the scale that we've seen in our lifetime. Um, what, what is it, you know, our, our mythologies about violence are pervasive and dysfunctional. We think that, you know, poverty uh, causes people to be violent. Rich people will kill each other too. Uh, <laughs> we think that calling a conflict ethnic will tell us something about more, it tells us something about why people are different. It doesn't tell us almost anything about why they're killing each other over their differences. Um, so how do we prevent the emergence, the spread, or the resumption of mass violence? In part, it begins with creating capable societies, societies that can govern themselves and, and, their, and, themselves and their relations with neighbors in peace, relative peace. And it's, is it representative governance? Is it market economic activity? Is it robust civil society based on the rule of law? These are all things we know. How do we do them? We've seen lots of examples in practice. We shouldn't accept war as the weather. Go ahead, Alfred. Yes, uh, I, I think your question has to do with the difference between government, governance and government. Uh, governance is when you are in a boat, in a tempest, and you organize things to bail water, trim the sails, tight the ropes, etc. Government is the guy who says the boat should go that direction and who's going to be thrown overboard so you can save the others. So when you talk about violence uh, and how to, to, to confront violence, we are talking about govern more than governance. Governance is the everyday management. Government is to take real decisions in very special situations. So how can we do that when local governments, when governments are becoming local managers of a global connected logic uh, 
And uh, how, how can we do that? I agree that it will be horrible to have a world government. It will be probably totally uh, authoritarian. I thought you just called for that. No, 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 not at all. I'm, I'm saying that that's where it can, lead, it can go, uh, the, the system can go. Uh, but I don't think it's, it's going to be authoritarian. But if we cannot manage this, we're going to have small uh, governments in uh, cities or whatever. In places where the elites don't want to give in, you can have authoritarian governments where you, where you kill everybody to have peace inside. Uh, you can have many things like that. Uh, but I can't see how this kind of system will distribute wealth in an acceptable way. Uh, Question here? Yeah. Uh, yesterday we had a panel. I come from Brazil. My name is Marcos Freitas. And we had a panel on the manifestations that took place in Brazil in June. And one of the reasons was because the government had failed to deliver many of the public services that people now, since they became middle and middle class, they feel they're entitled to. Now, we are looking to the wider Atlantic and we see a population that is aging, unemployment that is on the rise, and technology that is improving. Now, if I have these three things in the future, I do see lots of have-nots, which may become a major concern for future disruptions. Now, a government that cannot address the basic services for the communities, well, what, do we, what do you think would be like two or three things that they would need to do to retool the workforce so that it can meet the challenges of this new century? Go ahead, Juan. Well, it's, it's also one, one of the cliches I still haven't put in, in my draw, but uh, education would be a, a, a key part of, of it. Uh, what uh, Alfredo was mentioning of the Internet of Things. Let's imagine in the very near future that the jet engine of a flight from uh, Rabat to Paris will generate five gigas of information every flight. Every time it flies every day, it would create five gigas of information of how the gasoline of the engine will interact with the temperature, with the altitude of the plane, with the uh, speed of the wind. All this information will be translated into databases to create the next generation of jet engines. Who will read those databases? Who will be able to understand this amount of information just created by, by a single aircraft? Je technology creates a lot of stress and uh, it will affect uh, population all over the world but it also opens opportunities but those opportunities could be grasped only for the countries that would be ready to do it and in that regard education for example uh, go going back to the first topic I mentioned energy one of the big obstacles that the U.S. has to achieve energy independence is not lack of hydrocarbon resources, it's lack of engineers. How would, would the U.S. confront this scarcity? The most obvious uh, uh, answer is immigration. But the U.S. will be ready to have engineers from all over the world solving its energy, uh, energy problems which countries will be prepared and willing to see people working abroad, not, not as a, a fuga de cerebros, like a brain drain, but as an opportunity to create networks in, in different sides of the Atlantic, from north and south, from more developed economies to more undeveloped economies, and understand that this goes as part of, of human nature looking for better opportunities, but that, those opportunities for the people that come to work from a, a different country than the one they study could become also and could become a trigger of opportunity for people in their, in their uh, native countries. So education, I think it's, it's one of, of the key, key parts of the answer. I think uh, what we saw in Brazil uh, in Turkey, uh, throughout the Middle East, uh, in the Occupy movement on Wall Street in the United States, is a reflection that people around the world are angry 
They're angry. Uh, and, and this anger, at least seems to me, not to be a purpose-driven anger. When you have purpose-driven anger, people kill each other. This is an anxiety-based anger. And I think it stems from the fact that, you know, we don't trust the media, we don't trust the markets, we don't trust our governments in many cases. You know, we can't trust the dollar or the euro or many institutions have fallen from the pedestals that we've put them on over the course of our lives, and we're angry about it. And I think basically we're angry that we, f we feel as though we have lost the ability to architect trust in public space. That's deeply destabilizing and deeply disruptive in my view. What should governments do about it? You know, again, um, the, value, the basic value proposition of a government is to deliver threshold conditions of security, well-being, and justice. Let's take the internet and cyberspace. We all talk about cybersecurity and are we secure. The real question for some of us is, what role should government have in providing our security? Should governments be responsible for securing our identity and our information? Or should we do the four basic things, the four basic things that we can do today to prevent 85% of the intrusions that constitute hacking? Or should we continue to say hacking is disruptive? Well, for goodness sake, so are cavities in your head. But brush your teeth, floss, and visit your dentist. In the cyber equivalent, whitelist your software, limit your administrative permissions, and real-time patch your systems and your networks and reduce 80% of your vulnerability or more. So there's a lot more we can do on our own behalf without looking first to governments. Let's look first to ourselves. Well, that really um, sort of relates to a question that has come in from Charles Buchanan. Um, and he asks, will acceler accelerated and concentrated wealth creation by business groups require stronger governments to achieve equitable distribution of benefits? What do you think of that? Alfredo, do you have a... The, I, I'm not sure even if these strong business groups will be alive in 20 years' time. Uh, because things are going so fast that you, you, you're going to have new business groups coming in that, that are disrupting old business groups, etc. So w what I would like to say is that when uh, Jane says, uh, talks about architecture of trust, I think this lack of capacity comes also from the perception that we have an, uh, uh, we cannot architecture control, that we are losing control. And what, what I'm really afraid of is that these new technologies, uh, they enhance the possibility of controlling people's lives too. They, they have the, 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 the both things. So we are, we are entering in a kind of world where automaticity is, is being planned. For example, you, you have all, all your products in your fridge. Uh, in 10 years time, the, the fridge will, ask, will immediately buy the products that you, don't, that you need <laughs> and uh, your, your bank account will be <laughs> taken out for that, etc. So w when I see, for example, that in drones, uh, we are developing some kinds of technologies in order that the drone itself decides who, who to kill, for example. There, there is a possibility of that. So you, you can have a lot of automatic systems uh, and how we will have the illusion of being free. We will, will be free, connected, we'll talk to everybody, etc. But the whole architecture, the, as I say, the big algorithm, Who's going to control that? And I think that people who are left behind, they'll become even angrier and angrier. That's why I said, welcome to the Tea Party world. Uh, we're going to have uh, uh, left outs everywhere inside, inside the countries, the people who are in, the people who are out. Uh. Question here. I was scared, Luis, when you described a world in which it takes a mere six man hours to build a car because I see the disruption that is being caused by increased inequality in industrialized countries where the kind of jobs that the majority of human beings can do, which are jobs that do not demand the extraordinary brain power that we are privileged to have in this room, are the only jobs that uh, are available and are disappearing. The question to all of you is, is it not necessary to actually limit the impact of these automatic systems, the impact of that technology, to use fiscal tools, for example, to reduce the cost on labor and increase the cost of technology in order to reduce the disruptive effects of the inequality that this new world is bringing about. Thank you. So, certainly through the lifetime of everyone in this room, um, 
We've, the world has possessed weaponry that can destroy the planet. And the only thing that has stood between mankind and the oblivion is our judgment. So is, you know, do we remove the human element? Do we rem remove human agency from the impacts of technology? No, I mean, for, for you know, God willing, no. Uh, we need our judgment now more than ever. Uh, we need the judgment of, of the, empower, the empowerment that technology brings and for the majority that may have access to it, a responsibility for the minority that does not yet. Um, I believe very powerfully in putting information in the hands of people and, and coping with the consequences, having a dialogue. I mean, societies used to have dialogues with themselves through their governments. Um, some people say those days are gone. We need to restore them. We need a way to have a conversation, whether it's a, in New York City, uh, where is home for me, or in the United States, or in the Atlantic community. We need systems of dialogue to address these core questions. You know, yeah. oh, go ahead. Well, one of the most disruptive technologies of the 20th century, and disruptive in the sense of connect, connecting the world, it's basically an oversized shoebox, a container. The container displays so many jobs at uh, city ports because usually the, uh, before containers, people used to load the charge one by one and then you, you need dozens of people to unload a, a ship. Now you just need one with the, that manages the crane, one that manages the truck. Uh, technology is like a hammer. You could build a house with that or you could, you could harm someone with, with a tool. So trying to stop uh, technology, I, I don't see it as, as, a, as a positive signal from humankind. I, I also share the anguish where this wor world would lead us. But forbidding or, or limiting the advances of technology, as Alfredo was saying, for example, drones, now have the capability already, I think, in the border between North Korea and South Korea. There are robots which are programmed to shoot uh, to human beings without the intervention of a human being deciding to shoot the gun. Those are one, some kind of drones. But in other parts, they use drones, for example, to distribute medicines in countries that have lack of highway infrastructure. So it could be for good and bad. And, and the notion of trying to limit change and limit advances, I think it contravenes what, uh, and stops all the positive effects that could have. But obviously, in some parts of the world, and disruption, uh, that's, that's also uh, maybe relevant, that disruption it will be very different, geographically different, depending which part of the world you are. And, we could lose the possibilities of the positive potential if, if we try to stop it. Yes, I, I would be as, as optimistic as, as Jane on, the, on this. Uh, uh, in, the, in the 19th century, ludits were against spinning textile mills. Uh, and today we have this more or less the, the, the container, all this. There will be a new economy going up. There will be a lot of new uh, jobs, new that we don't even know that they're going to come up. So, this is a question of how to adapt to it. But there's a, 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 an underlying question in what you said, is who can decide to say, let's stop or not let's stop? Huh? Uh, you, you remember that uh, the, 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 the political philosopher, the German political philosopher Karl Schmitt said that sovereign is the one who decides on the exception. Huh? So who can decide on the exception? It's a question of decision. You, it's very difficult today, today to see who can decide with a system like this how to do it. My grandfather, uh, when he was a young lad, he came, uh, he was Brazilian, he came to, to Europe to make a big tour before the First World War. When somebody asked, nobody asked, but when sometimes one policeman asked who he was, he took his business card up. Today, we, we are in towns where you have cameras all over, you, you have to put your fingerprints all over, etc. You're much more controlled, but we don't know who's in control in the end. Even this NSA scandal, it's incredible. They amass such a huge mass of things, but in the end, what do you do with all that? Well, you can do little things. But so this is, I think, the real problem, the problem of decision 
automaticity and decision, uh, and who decides what and at what level. And I think that we should really work on all these things to see if the digital revolution will be a good revolution or a bad revolution. Question here. Hi, Lawrence Jones with Austin. Uh, what, I have a couple of comments and quick, two quick questions. Uh, first of all, regarding data, uh, from an energy perspective, when we come back to the Atlantic Basin, I think the convergence of energy and IT has been a positive thing, and I think there are a lot of things we can see regarding whether it's smart grids, microgrids, what is the deployment of distributed generation that are connected <coughs> to the homes. So I see a lot of positivity coming out of this whole idea of the convergence of energy and IT. Now, regarding this issue of governance that we've talked about and the disruptions that we see coming with technology. First of all, wouldn't it be wise if we step back and say to ourselves, why should the government of the future look like the government of today? You bring up the point about who should make a decision. Why should there be one decision maker? Maybe we should have a collaborative society where decisions are not made by individuals. I think to some extent, as I listen to this discussion, we seem to be stuck in a world where we want to move to the 21st century with mental models of today, but yet use technology of tomorrow. And I think that's a very important distinction we have to, to talk about, because mm -hmm. all of the models we have today that run our governments, that run societies, even the economic models of consuming more. What happens on Wall Street? The moment consumption index goes down, the stock market gets a little jittery, because we have to consume more. So unless we get a new mental model that says it's okay to have an efficient society where you don't overconsume and still be profitable, but who designs that mental model? Who designs that new business model that says it's not all about profit margins to be efficient or to be successful. We have other metrics to be efficient and successful. And then my last point I'd like for you to comment on is a lot of this discussion seems to be about sort of a north, north uh, Atlantic uh, dimensions. If we come to the South, we have a whole different dimension in the South. If we look at what's happening in Africa today, the challenge there is most African countries could be seeing what's happening in the North and be headed in that direction. So how do we guide societies that have not adapted some of the practices in the North to move in a direction that is much more feasible and much more sustainable in the future? Thank you. Great, thanks. Who I'll wants to I'll tackle that? And there, there was a very rich set of comments. I, I guess I, I, I'm coming back to, to something I've been thinking more and more about lately, which is what's the role of, what's our role in our lives? We've spent the past two and a half days talking about the role of governments largely. Um, and I'm much more interested in what's my role in my life? Uh, what's my role in my family? I mean, one of the things that we've learned, those of us who've dealt with international crises or crises uh, in our own homelands, um, what we've learned is if we don't have an informed population, we don't have a stable population. So how do we put news you can use in the hands of individuals so that they're not victims, so that they don't require you know, uh, external intervention or help, so that they can be agents of capacity and change on their own behalf? How do we create capable communities? I mean, in, in, in the United States, when we have natural disasters, FEMA is responsible for responding. Um, and we've built a sort of a tripartite system or tri-layer system of empowered individuals. We're trying to put out as much information as we possibly can so you know what to do. Uh, someone told me recently one of the core messages that they carry around in their head is 72's on you. Meaning for the first 72 hours in a crisis, I better be prepared to handle myself, my energy needs, my monetary needs, my food needs, my water needs, my information needs. How do we build capable communities? They know their vulnerabilities and their strengths. They also know which roads are out, which stores are open, which people, the elderly, they may need to check on. And we're trying to build a responsive federal system. Notice I mentioned that last, um, because the United States, the federal government is not the first responder. Governments are not the first responder, locals are. And so how do we recognize that reality? It's not a perfect answer to your question, how does the South mirror the North? I don't know that many people in the South are interested in simply mirroring the North, but rather having systems and processes that have been in indigenously derived and are sustainable uh, for the communities that live there. Well, uh, I, I, I would try to answer a question on two, two ways. 
The first that I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm always a little skeptical about cooperative government, uh, maybe because I'm, I'm too old. Uh, yes. <laughs> and uh, it's for, for, uh, also for a reason, that evil exists, jealousy exists, envy exists, cruelty exists, sin exists. So when you are confronted with that, you need some form of decision making at some moments. Uh, you need the guarantors of last resort. And I don't believe that the cooperation, you don't do war by committee, and you don't do police work by committee. So somewhere in big disruption, big problems, you need. So we don't know yet. Before we would say, well, the United the, 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 the American <coughs> cavalry, the U.S. cavalry will arrive if there's a real a big problem. We're not sure anymore that the U.S. cavalry will arrive. Uh, so it's, uh, <laughs> it's, going, it's going to be quite difficult on this. On Africa, I think it's very interesting because Africa is adopting new technologies even faster than in the, the old countries. Uh, that, that's really interesting uh, what is happening. But the problem with Africa is how this new uh, technology will bloom if there is no social space, a political space to make it bloom. So there is a contradiction between this huge uh, adoption of new technology and governments that want to stick to their power and their things. So how this is going to, to act, we don't know. Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe we will go to beautiful democracies. I'm not sure. May, or maybe we will go to return to very authoritarian states where we kill people for not using the technology. Huh? So uh, this is the problem. I think Africa has a very good moment now because it doesn't have all the old infrastructure that we had and it can go quickly to, 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 to the new model. But the problem is that in Africa, you, even in the countries of Africa, you're going to have cities or regions, they're going to thrive with that and you have other parts of the same country that will be going down. And this is the, the question, how local government can deal with that, it cannot. National government cannot. Supranational government cannot either. So, okay, it's a big question mark. Maybe I'm too pessimistic because I'm old, I'm going to die, and, you know. Uh, yeah. Juan. No, I, I want to follow on, on the argument of, of local government for uh, uh, global anguishes. Uh, there's a book just published by Benjamin Barber called What If Majors Rule the World? And uh, he, he had a very clever part that uh, he was saying like uh, city governments are much more pragmatical than national governments uh, because there is no the conservative way to pick up the garbage or a liberal way to pick up the garbage. You just simply need to pick up the garbage. You need policing. You need to guarantee traffic to flow. Uh, so there is no room for ideology, which is quite a good I improvement. There's uh, the, and, and the national scale, if, if you see it, nations are quite humane in, in humane institutions in the sense that for a US citizen, for example, that was born and lived all his life in Alabama, well, his notion of the US, maybe it's totally different than someone that lived in New York or California. Hum we, we need uh, human beings, our hindsight, it's much more shorter than, than the size of a nation. So cities in that regard are much more humane and the potential to give humane answers to our anguish, I think, are, are, are fostered by, by the power of local governments. Uh, challenges like redistribution of income, for example, comes much more complicated if you look at it city level and not at national level because the pool of distribution is much more wider. But the, the pragmatist uh, approach to public policy that uh, cities have should be like the guiding light to, to kind of confront all, all these uh, issues from a smart grid, electricity smart grid. It's much more easier to foresee it as a, as a city grid that as a national grid, no? Or how to solve poverty in a, in, a country, in a city with two million people or in a country with 30 million people. Problems so, uh, look more, much more solvable from the urban perspective, no? 
We have um, about 10 minutes left. Jane, you wanted to jump in, um, make your comment quickly. We're going to have a question from you and a question from you. Keep the, keep the questions short. I want to get you both in and get the responses. Go ahead. These, these issues are forcing our values into greater proximity of each other. Um, take privacy. Um, but I negotiated an agreement between the United States and the EU on privacy. The American view of privacy is different than the European view of privacy. It's just different. Um, and we need to respect the legitimacy of each other's views. Um, and that, but all of these issues are forcing our values into greater proximity. Question here. Thank you. I am Dina from Mexico. And sometimes the conversation gets very abstract and, and far away. Uh, so in front of all these uh, snowball changes and, and growing interconnectedness, I think we can't or at least shouldn't forget that our, our own very nature, we're just humans. Uh, so yes, we need to balance thinking out of the box and going away from cliches, as Juan says, and perhaps balancing this with going back to basics. What do I mean? Yes, education. Uh, but what kind of education? That's, that's a critical question. What would be your ideal pl plan as experts from the, from the panel? I'm very curious to hear your, your proposal to embrace the present and the future in a just, positive, inclusive way. So what, what kind of skills and values do you think we need to embrace uh, specifically and since childhood? How do we create these capable communities? through which values and skills? Thank you. Which one of you wants to take that? Uh, so I'll, I'll give an answer full of cliches. Um, <laughs> uh, you, do you want to prevent violent conflict, educate young women, and employ young men? The rest is commentary. The rest is commentary. That's, that's not a cliche. Um, that's not a cliche. <laughs> and, and you know, what does education do? Education allows you to know, understand, or do something that you couldn't before you were educated. But we need to invest in our, in our youth, absolutely. And young women are systematically not valued as much as young men around the world. Uh, perhaps true in each of our societies in ways that we really need to confront. Educate young women, employ young men. Question here. Good afternoon. I'm João Ribeiro, Director General for Maritime Policy in Portugal, responsible for the ocean, National Ocean Strategy. And uh, my, uh, my question is for, for you, Paul. Uh, I've heard a lot about the information in the sense that we are addressing an enabler. But in, an enabler for what? Uh, it's a, a disruption, in fact. Uh, perhaps also, and I'm sure, a very beneficial disruption in terms of fighting against poverty and, uh, and exclusion, because actually if you have data <coughs> transparent, it will be more readily available and could be a raw material for someone who can take benefit of that and the benefit of the whole society. But again, it seems to me that we are not focused on real opportunities that the Atlantic can, can provide in terms of who knows, future disruptions. We spoke about energy. But can you develop a bit more on what are the strategic objectives we can set in the Atlantic towards a sustainable development in the benefit of the continents and addressing economic, social, and environmental issues? Okay, which one of you wants to take that? Alfredo. Well, this is, this is very complicated because uh, how do you how do you put together these this, this Atlantic? This is the how, why why we do this forum is to have ideas on how to do it. Uh, it's not it's not so easy. What we can say, everybody knows that, is that uh, uh, the the energy picture is coming to the Atlantic. You have oil on both sides coming in. Uh, in the Atlantic, you have most of the uh, world's f uh, commodity food production. So you, you have a lot of things that you can do uh, to, 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 to contribute to world peace on, the, on this. But I will take your hint uh, uh, of being a maritime and the Atlantic. The Atlantic historically was a place where people just left. Ter uh, uh, history 
shows that freedom is much more linked to the capacity of voting with your feet than with big ideas. Uh, the Europeans, in the, in the beginning of the 16th century, you had more than 200,000 Europeans that went out of Europe to go to the Americas, uh, uh, to South America, Central America, etc., because they wanted to be kings there, because they wanted to be free. Uh, and this just squashed the old feudal system in, in, uh, in, in, in Europe. So freedom is linked to the capacity of going somewhere else. The problem we have today is that with the integrating world, there is no someone else. So are we, de are we developing a kind of authoritarian system with automaticity, etc.? But where are the possibilities of voting with your feet? And uh, I would like to, to, to finish with one absolutely far-fetched idea, uh, which is I think it's rather interesting to see that we are seeing in the United States, beginning in the United States, privatization of space exploration and space travel. And I'm not sure when you have all these guys saying, let's go to Mars in 20 years' time or whatever, isn't it a kind of, isn't it the human species already saying, well, maybe it's time to find another place to go because this one is going to be too much authoritarian. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually lied when I said that there were only two more questions. I completely forgot about this gentleman right here who I gave a microphone to about 10 minutes ago, so he will have a question. Yeah, thank you, John. Just a quick question. You talked at the beginning about unknown unknowns. About Sorry, what? now you hear me. You talked at the beginning, I'm Roberto Dondich from Mexico. You talked about the, at the beginning about unknowns unknowns. About? Which, unknowns, 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 right? Ronsfeld's theory. So that probably is the reality that we live in right now. In that case, what we need is for governments to have the flexibility to respond to, to the unknowns that come about. We know that governments are normally not very flexible. We can explain the, the tequila crisis, the tango crisis, because of the lack of flexibility that the governments had in order to react and avoid crisis. We talk about the local governments and the idea of bringing local governments to the, to, to the major logic, but we have experience when, where local government actions taken to the federal government actually don't necessarily work. It's a different reality. So how can we create the flexibility into governments in order for them to be able to work and to react to what's coming up? I, I, I really like this question because I think it, it exposes the intersection of three things. Um, governments have size, they don't have speed. <laughs> um, but effective policy really has three components. Number one, it has a trajectory. What's the right thing to do? Uh, number two, it has a size, a mass to it. How many of us are doing it? And number three, it has a speed. How fast or slow are we going? I think, you know, quite frankly, the problems and the solutions to many of the things we're talking about in this room today, even two years from now, have not been invented yet. That's certainly true in IT and cyber with 3D printing and all of the other capacities that we're seeing. So it's really going to take a combination, not only of governments individually, not only of citizens individually, but of all of us collectively to get trajectory, size, and speed right. Yes, you were talking about, I think you're talking about black swans. So, uh, I would be optimistic about that. I mean, when you have, in, in, in every, every, everything, when you have a very interconnected system, uh -huh. a, a, a network of connections, you, you have a problem with that because any crisis somewhere can expand to the whole system. But you have a big strength on that, is that when it's really interconnected, you can circumvent the crisis part and reconstruct the system around it. This is in biology, you have that, everywhere, everywhere you have that. It's bad for the guys who are in the problem thing, but the, the big thing will keep going on. So I'm not catastrophist on that. I, I, I don't think, uh, even if now the, the, this book in the United States is make, make a, uh, a huge splash, which is without us, uh, if the human species gets, uh, destroy itself, 
maybe the, the, the world will be better. I don't think we are in that, in, in the, in, in that stuff. So I'll be more optimistic than you are on the automaticity of controls, but that doesn't mean decision-making. This is a problem. Juan, did you want to jump in? Yeah, maybe the most disruptive power of our generation, it's the power that each individual has. This, this phone, for example, has the same capacity to process information that the NASA had at the time where the man reached the moon. And we all here have this kind of power in our pockets. What does that mean? It could have a very uh, bad side if you look at it the, of terrorists. A very, a very small network of people have the power to, of enormous drum and violent disruption. But it also could have a, a positive effect. A single individual could create the most, uh, the biggest diplomatic crisis on spying between <laughs> countries. And it's, we're just talking of a very uh, small, narrow group of individuals that is creating a global diplomatic com uh, conflict that will bring about this crisis much more account accountability towards government. So we are, we are facing a new, the new power of the individual. Some of the biggest companies now in the world, as, as it, they were mentioned, they didn't exist 10 or 15 years before. Some of them were created in a garage by a set of leaders and individuals, and they are also disrupting the economy. So we are, individuals are challenging the state, challenging economic institutions. It has an enormous potential for good, and it also has enormous risks in, uh, that come with it. No? And on that note, I, please thank our panelists. Juan Pardinas, Jane Lute, and Alfredo Valdaglio. And, and please thank our wonderful moderator. That was a terrific session. Thanks. Really great.